I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case King v. Burwell, one of the Supreme Court cases from 2015 about the Affordable Care Act. This is actually part two. I broke the video into two parts, and this one is for both my administrative law class and my statutory interpretation and regulation class, because in this video, I'm actually going to show, uh, focus on the Chevron part of the case and um, Chevron step zero and the major questions exception to Chevron. And in a sense, this is a follow-up to, um, uh, to my lecture about FDA versus Brown and Williamson, which the court cites extensively in King v. Um, Burwell and sort of is the last word on that, but they sort of break new ground with what they did in um, Brown and Williamson tobacco. Now, again, understand if you're reading this case, it's very complicated. It's about the Affordable Care Act, which is a very complex statute. And most of the opinion is devoted to a, a rather um, convoluted uh, statutory interpretation, uh, an attempt by the majority opinion, Justice Roberts, to save the statute, right? To, to pick an interpretation that won't thwart the will of the legislature. But let's look at what happens in the Chevron part of the case. And I also should point out for my students that um, the in my statutory interpretation casebook, um, the, uh, uh, um, the whole Chevron part of the case is actually missing in the case excerpt. So uh, I'm just going to tell you about it here. This was a case about the Affordable Care Act, as I said, and its requirement that each state has an exchange or a marketplace that allows people to compare and purchase um, insurance plans. And the act gives each state the opportunity to set up its own sort of online exchange, but says if they don't, then the federal government is going to come in and it's basically going to be Health and Human Services that sets up the exchange um, because the state didn't. And the crux of this case is the interpretation of a statutory phrase in a provision dealing with the distribution of tax credits for the purchase of health insurance um, from these marketplaces or exchanges. And um, ultimately, whether the plaintiffs are going to, um, because they're ineligible for tra tax credits, also be exempt from having to buy insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Now, the court at the beginning of the opinion addresses Chevron deference, because remember we have some agencies here like the IRS, the Treasury Department, um, is whose interpretation of a particular um, phrase about the exchanges is that either type of exchange counts as an exchange for tax exemptions and health and human services. Um, so the court acknowledges that we have a couple of agencies and primarily the IRS, who have an interpretation here that normally the court would give Chevron deference to, right? If the agency has an interpretation of its own statute or the statute that it has to interpret or help implement, then the courts usually defer to that agency because Congress intended that. But the, Justice Roberts says Chevron does not provide the appropriate framework here. And then he cites this case, FDA versus Brown and Williamson Tobacco, for the idea that Chevron deference does not apply to major policy questions, even if the statute is a little ambiguous. Now, the tax credits are one of the Act's key reforms, and whether they're available on federal exchanges is a question of what the court calls deep economic and political significance. So this is a big deal, right? If the plaintiffs win, this could sort of... Um, make the Affordable Care Act implode. And they know that, and that's why they brought the case, right? Um, is that this isn't just about them. This is really a challenge to make the whole scheme set up by Obamacare um, uh, fall apart and start coming apart. The now, if Con and they say if Congress had wanted to assign that big of a question, basically whether Obamacare survives or not to an agency, it really would have, or at least should have, spelled it out in the statute, which it did not do. The court here, here says it seems, quote, especially unlikely that Congress would have delegated this decision to the IRS, which really has no expertise in crafting health insurance policy of this sort. So the IRS, remember, is interpreting a one provision of the Affordable Care Act that's about tax credits. But the tax credits have a lot of implications for who then has is, 
gets an exemption under the individual mandate, which was the um, subject of an earlier round of litigation against the Affordable Care Act. So it makes sense that the IRS is interpreting a, pro a provision about tax credits and who gets the tax credits. But he's saying it doesn't make sense that the IRS should get to decide whether um, Obamacare survives or not. There's no reason to think that Congress would have just left that to the IRS or left um, the fate of um, the Affordable Care Act in the hands of the IRS. So the court acknowledges that the text is ambiguous, mostly due to its contradictions, which is a little weird, and says that the meaning must be ascertained by putting the words in context, avoiding surplusage, and by that, that's a canon of statutory construction, surplusage, that says we should interpret the word so that, assuming that the words there have effect, and we're not just making uh, interpreting some parts of the statute in a way that makes other words meaningless and or, or just fluff or redundant stuff in the statute. The opinion then undertakes its own interpretation and concludes that the petitioners are incorrect. In the other words, they are eligible for the tax um, credits. I'm sorry, not for the tax, but the tax credits. And the weird thing is that this seems to be the same as the agency's interpretation. Here's a quote about Chevron that's um, interesting and gives us kind of the late one of our recent words on Chevron from the US Supreme Court. Chevron quote is premised on the theory that a statute's ambiguity constitutes an important delegation from Congress to the agency to fill in statutory gaps. In extraordinary cases, however, there may be reason to hesitate before concluding that Congress has intended such an implicit delegation. And this is one of those cases. In other words, we have a major questions exception where we're not going to give Chevron deference for the big picture policy questions. And, but don't get too excited about that. That doesn't really, that's not the exception that swallows the rule, so to speak, with Chevron, because it's going to only apply in, Justice Roberts says, extraordinary cases. Oftentimes the meaning, this is from another part of the opinion, or ambiguity of certain words or phrases may become uh, may only become evident when placed in context. So when deciding whether the language is plain, the court must read the words in their context and with a view to their place in the overall statutory scheme. Just to kind of give away what the court does with its statutory interpretation section, I discussed that in a separate video, but they basically really make a structural argument. This is using the whole statute the overall gist of the whole statute to interpret confusing provisions. Now, I wanna come back to this idea of its reliance on the Brown and Williamson case, because it cites that over and over again. And for the idea that there's a major questions exception to Chevron, but they really apply it in a different way here. And in Brown and Williamson, the major questions idea came in at Chevron step one. In other words, this was, just to, to recap for my students, the, this was a case where the FDA had tried to regulate cigarettes and by classifying nicotine as a drug. And the Supreme Court said, Okay, so the question, the statute's unclear. Uh, uh, um, we're going to apply Chevron deference, but then when they get to step step one, is a statute um, clear or ambiguous? They say, well, um, there's no. It is perfectly clear that Congress didn't intend the FDA to get to shut down the whole tobacco industry or, and ban cigarettes, right? So they basically say that the statute was clear in Brown and Williamson. They don't say it's ambiguous, but Chevron doesn't apply. They say we go to Chevron in Brown and Williamson, but at step one, the, um, the, the, the statute's clear. And so we don't have to give any deference to the agency. Now here, please note it's being applied at what we call step zero with an unclear statute, which is a little different. So this is a diagram I made um, for my discussion about Mead, about USB Mead, which is what brought us Chevron step zero. So originally Chevron step zero is the question of, does Chevron deference even apply? And I know this is confusing. There's a lot of different were types of deference we have like Chevron deference, Skidmore deference, our deference, but bear with me here. And 
So the original um, position in Mead and the cases that followed Mead seemed to be, does the interpretation have the force of law? So some of the things that agencies do that aren't really regu promulgating regulations or don't have the force of law wouldn't get Chevron deference. That might be because they didn't do notice and comment rulemaking, or even if they did, it might be because this really doesn't apply in, uh, as a like legal rule. But here, notice that we're also saying at Chevron step zero that the major questions exception can kick in so that we don't proceed through the Chevron steps. Um, and the uh, Chevron step one would then be is a relevant statute ambiguous or silent on the question? And if yes, is the agency's interpretation reasonable? And so the problem is that, remember at Brown and Williamson, the, which kind of brought us the major questions exception to Chevron, they were doing it at Chevron step one. And in this case, we're actually doing it a step backwards before we get to step one and doing it at Chevron step zero. If you find that confusing, you're in good company, right? This is a, a kind of a surprising sleight of hand or maneuver by Justice Roberts that he moves through very quickly at the beginning of the opinion, just assuming we have a major questions exception and that's why we're not applying Chevron at all. Well, we got the major questions exception from a case that was invoking it at Chevron step one. And so remember and just, uh, to recall, uh, recap, what do, what do we mean by Chevron step zero? Either Chevron applies or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, normally Skidmore would apply. And so, and if it does apply, then we ask, is the statute ambiguous? And is the statute reasonable? And if Skidmore applies, then we would go to the Skidmore factors. Well, the question here it, with Chevron step zero, they don't really acknowledge that they're going to Skidmore, right? They never, they never go on to the Skidmore factors and say, so we're deferring to the agency because they have expertise and are entitled to respect and so forth. But the other weird thing is to be honest, the court ends up reaching the same interpretation. So Robert says, we're not following Chevron. Um, and then he says, the statute is ambiguous and then comes up with his own interpretation, which is basically exactly what the agency was saying was its interpretation as far as I can tell. So he says, we're not doing Chevron. But then he might as well, to be honest, I know this is confusing, he might as well have been because he still says the statute is ambiguous and then says um, that this interpretation is a reasonable one because it saves the statute, but I came up with it myself. I'm not getting it from the agency. And this is again, a little confusing because in Mead, which brought us Chevron step zero, um, you would then proceed to Skidmore and at, go through Skidmore factors, which this opinion doesn't do. And so um, that kind of concludes my lecture about this part, the Chevron part of King v. Burwell. To be honest, I thought about just calling this video Chevron step whatever, um, because it's a little weird what Justice Roberts does here with Chevron. On the other hand, I went ahead and made this lecture for my administrative law students so that you can see how complicated Chevron cases get, right? So in the classroom, we can present these tidy little two steps and the bubble theory and things like that, and it all seems to make sense. And then when we see these Chevron cases come out term after term from the Supreme Court, sometimes they're doing something that looks a little bit like a sleight of hand, or they skip some steps or a little bit of legal shorthand that it, we're, saying, we're left scratching our heads saying, wait a second, which Chevron step are we at? Or if we're not applying Chevron, then what are we doing? The court claims to be doing essentially de novo review, its own review here, and then reaches the same conclusion that the agency did. So in practice, they could have just said that the agency was reasonable, but maybe because this was such a controversial case and so highly charged, Justice Roberts wanted to make it sound like the court was interpreting it on its own. Okay, that concludes my part two lecture about King v. Burwell.